continue our look at the cardiovascular system. I look at the blood vessels in which we send all of our blood through and distribute it through the body itself. So the cardiovascular system itself is essentially a closed system. And so we have the heart and the blood vessels. And so we have our arteries leaving the heart. We then move into capillaries where we can distribute and pick up substances to and from the tissues. And then we have the veins to bring all of that back towards the heart. And then we start the, the process to go move through the lungs and exchange gases there as well. So when we talk about arteries and veins and capillaries and things, um, in general, by kind of definition, arteries are taking blood away from the heart and veins are going to bring that blood back towards the heart, regardless of what the oxygen content itself is. And this becomes important when we start to look at the blood vessels around the heart because those blood vessels, blood vessels that leave the heart and go towards the lungs, our pulmonary trunk, are arteries and yet they are low in oxygen. And so when we see them on a picture or on a model, things like that, they're going to be blue even though they are a artery. And then same thing when we come and bring that blood back to the heart through veins from the lungs, um, those blood vessels are veins and yet they're going to be oxygen rich. And so they're going to be found as being red on things like drawings and, and uh, models and things like that as well. The capillaries, we can't really see on models and, and so on, um, unless it's specifically for the capillaries, simply because they are microscopic. So when you look at the blood vessels themselves, they have kind of a similar makeup, whether we're talking about an artery or a vein. Um, they have the same three layers of uh, tissue to them that we call tunics. And so we have a tunica interna, a tunica media, and a tunica externa. And so we have three different layers to the walls of the blood vessels themselves. And this is, these are going to be the same whether we're talking about arteries or veins. Um, it's just that the distribution of each is going to change depending upon whether we're talking about an artery or vein. And then depending upon what type of artery we're talking about as well. At the very center of the blood vessels is the opening. Um, this is our lumen, and this is where the blood is going to be found inside of them. When it comes to the capillaries, the capillaries are typically just a single layer of tissue, and that's it. And so they have an endothelium, they have the inner lining that we find for our arteries and veins, um, but typically this is a single uh, cell layer thick so as to allow for all of that distribution of oxygen and carbon dioxide and nutrients and waste from to and from the tissues that we're going to. So here we can kind of see a, a difference between the vessels themselves. And so in terms of the arteries, the arteries tend to have a relatively small lumen, where, whereas veins have a large lumen. Um, and that is due in part and mostly to this tunica media. And so the tunica media here in the muscle, in the uh, arteries is mostly smooth muscle. And so there's a large layer of smooth muscle that's there, but in the veins, it's relatively thin. And so it doesn't have a whole lot to it once it's there. Uh, things like the tunica externa, if we were to measure kind of the, the distance there and the distance there, um, basically the same uh, for the two. Our tunica intima or tunica interna, same thing. Uh, we have the layers that are there um, and they're roughly the, the same thickness and everything that's there. With the one main difference being that the veins have valves. And so they have one-way valves in them to help to control the flow of blood and maintain it in a singular direction. Because the venous side does not have a pump, whereas the arterial side does have the heart pumping the blood and constantly increasing the, the blood pressure that is within it to allow for that movement to go there. So that lumen size is going to be one of the major differences between arteries and veins as well. Um, and that's going to make it so that essentially the pressure on that arterial side is going to be much greater because we have a lot smaller of a space versus the, the lumen on the venous side. We have a very large space. The pressure itself is going to drop there tremendously. And then down here we have a capillary. And so we have our endothelial cells lining the inside. That is the same thing as the endothelium that we had over here on our arteries and veins, um, except that it's usually just a, a single layer. And then we've got a basal lamina 
surrounding the outside of that as well. And that's where, where we're going to be our exchange of substances. Take a little bit deeper look into the individual layers themselves in terms of what we find there. And so the endothelial layer is what we find on the innermost layer. This is what we would see on the very inside of a uh, blood vessel. And so this is the, the part where the blood is in a sense kind of bumping into in a sense uh, once it's there. This is a very non-stick layer. doesn't really allow for the blood to get caught or trapped or anything within it. Um, and it's surrounded by a connective tissue basement membrane. So we have a subendothelial uh, basement membrane that is there. And this is going to be relatively thin. It's about a millimeter um, in terms of the entire size of that whole vessel. And so we're talking about just simply uh, layers of cells thick in terms of this uh, component that's there for the basement membrane and the endothelium itself. <clears throat> the middle layer is mostly smooth muscle. And so we've got a large amount of smooth muscle in here. Um, in the tunica media there. Depending upon the type of vessel that we have as well, we're going to have varying amounts of both smooth muscle and elastic fibers. And so we have elastic tissue that is here. And this is going to allow us to have kind of that rebound or the stretch that we see in blood vessels themselves. And so this allows for it to kind of expand and constrict depending upon the needs at that time. This is all controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. And so we have our uh, sympathetic nervous system controlling the amount of smooth muscle tone that is there. The more tone we have, the more vasoconstriction we're going to get. The less tone from the sympathetic nervous system that we get, the more vasodilation we will have. And so we can either increase things like press blood pressure, so we can increase our blood pressure, or we can decrease our blood pressure, all depending upon the particular needs at that moment. Uh, for what we have going on there. The last layer is our tunica externa or our tunica adventitia. This is the layer that we would see in a sense if we kind of opened up the skin and looked inside for a blood vessel. This is, would be the outermost aspect that we have there, the thing that we can actually see uh, from the outside of the blood vessel. It has a large amount of collagen fibers in it, and these collagen fibers are going to serve as a means for helping with blood clotting later on that we'll talk about uh, to help to start to trap some of the, the platelets that are flowing through that broken blood vessel that's there. The component here that we're trying to do is essentially protect the blood vessel and so provide for some protection to, for, to that blood vessel, provide for some resistance to expansion of the blood vessel, stretching, things like that in terms of the blood vessel that's there. In our larger blood vessels, we're also going to have what's called a vasovasorum. So vasovasorum, essentially vessels of the vessels. And so we have a blood vessel, and when it's a larger blood vessel, that blood vessel needs to have, in a sense, its own blood supply. So it's going to have its own arteries and veins essentially surrounding it to allow for nutrients to get into the different layers of the blood vessel itself. The smaller blood vessels can just simply pull from the extracellular fluid or from the vessels themselves and get the nutrients that they need. For arteries, we have some different types in terms of the arteries that we see, depending upon uh, what their function is going to be and also kind of their distance from the heart in a sense. And so how far have we moved away from the heart on the arterial side? And so the first set of arteries that we have are our elastic or conducting arteries. Their job, as the, the name kind of implies, is to conduct the blood away from the heart. But as we saw when we talked about the, the cardiovascular system, when we look at um, pressure, we see that the pressure rises in the ventricle and ultimately in the aorta and then it falls down and then it rises and then falls down. And as that does so, the vessels themselves are going to have to essentially be able to absorb that pulse. And so they're gonna to have to be able to resist the stretch that is there. And so with these blood vessels, they have a large amount of elastin, 
And so we have elastic tissue found all throughout all three of the tunics. And so this allows that blood vessel to go from being one size to the next with each contraction of the heart. And so we have the ability to allow them to stretch out. If that blood vessel, as we changed our pressure, so here we have this, here we have this, come back down the regular, and then expand again. If instead of being able to go to the next size, if every time we had that smaller blood vessel there, our pressure would go up dramatically because we need to have that that decreased resistance from the blood vessels in order to maintain blood pressure and not have it skyrocket every time that we have a pulse. And so the pulse pressure is that difference between our diastolic and systolic pressures that is occurring every time that we have the contraction of the heart itself. And so rather than having these big spikes and then back down and then big spike and then back down, this allows for that pulse pressure to, to be more maintained um, and allow for as well a kind of mean arterial pressure. And so we have an arterial pressure that has a steady pressure to it within there. And that allows for us to have this constant flow of blood rather than having in a sense kind of a surge of blood and then the pressure dropping and a surge of blood and then the pressure dropping and we're not able to maintain that constant flow of blood through them. From those elastic arteries, we move into our muscular arteries and the muscle, muscular arteries are going to uh, begin as we start to get into some smaller blood vessels uh, within them. As their name tells us, they do have a larger amount of smooth muscle inside their tunica media. So we have smooth muscle in the tunica media and they're going to be less elastic, so they're not going to stretch out quite as much. Because they have all of that uh, smooth muscle there, they're going to allow for us to actively alter our vessel size. So we're going to have active vasoconstriction. So when needed, we can take that blood vessel and make it even smaller if we need to. If we want to relax that blood vessel, we can then make it larger. And so we can actively change the size of the, the blood vessel as we have it there in the muscular arteries that are there. This will get us all the way down to the arterioles. And so this will take us from essentially the elastic arteries, the larger of our, our blood vessels, get us deeper into the tissues and allow us to find those arterioles. The arterioles themselves are going to be just outside of the capillary beds. And so these are going to be just outside the capillary beds where we're going to deliver the nutrients and pick up the waste products from our uh, tissues that is there. Some of those smooth muscles are going to allow us to uh, change the flow of blood into the capillary beds. And so we can either have a capillary bed be vasodilated and allow for an increase in flow or we can vasoconstrict going into that capillary bed and we can decrease the flow of blood into that uh, tissue and into that capillary bed. And so this is going to have an increased metabolism in terms of the tissues that are there. This would have a decreased metabolism within the tissues. So here we have just a comparison of the different vessels themselves as far as our arterial side goes. We started out in the elastic arteries. Those elastic arteries have a large amount of elastic tissue within them. Still a lot of smooth muscle, um, but kind of more of an even match per se. Between the muscular arteries then, we go to a very large amount of smooth muscle, relatively small amount of elastic tissue inside there. And then the arterioles, as we're heading into the capillary beds, uh, we maintain some of that smooth muscle that's there. And in certain areas, that smooth muscle is going to kind of thicken and create a little sphincter so that we can control the blood flow going into our capillaries once we get into those at that point. And then on the venous side, which we'll talk about just in a moment, uh, we start out in essentially on our way through the system. Uh, we're going to begin in venules, and so smaller vessels.
and then those are going to feed into veins and get us into larger and larger vessels on our way back towards the heart. So for the capillaries, this is where we're doing all of our exchange. And so this is where we essentially just need to have a, a single layer, one cell thick, to allow for very quick, um, very easy movement of substances through the walls of those capillaries. And so at times, those vessels are also relatively small. To the point where basically a single red blood cell can fit through and that's it. Sometimes those red blood cells may need to even kind of bend and twist when we talked about them before. Um, we said that part of the aging process kind of stiffens those cells and makes it difficult for them to travel through some of our smallest blood vessels. And here's an example of that exactly happening is we have to have uh, red blood cells be able to kind of squeeze and, and feed through the capillary beds themselves that are there. Surrounding the outside of that one cell, we then are going to have some connective tissue. And that connective tissue itself may again just be a single layer of tissue in terms of it being our pericytes that surround the outside. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a basement membrane that is there and that's it. So we don't have a whole lot when it comes to the capillaries themselves. The capillaries do come in three different varieties, though. Uh, the majority of them are continuous capillaries. And then we have fenestrated and sinusoids as well. And also going from the along the lines here, as we move along towards this side, we have the least leaky and then the most leaky in terms of what can get through the, the capillaries themselves, how much uh, content from the blood is able to, to kind of seep through. And here we have an example of the fact that our red blood cells are just barely fitting through a capillary. And so the, the capillary itself is um, almost just as wide as those red blood cells are and they're going through basically single file through the capillaries. And so they're making their way through there and on their way to the tissue and any nutrients that may be inside here have the ability to go through those endothelial cells with great ease and move on out into the tissues. So our continuous capillaries are the ones that we have the, the greatest numbers of in terms of the capillaries themselves. Um, these are the ones that are going to be basically in the majority of our tissues. Uh, they're going to have, when we look at the lining of the vessels themselves, the endothelium creates a perfect lining on the inside. It's completely uninterrupted. The cells themselves are tightly held together by those tight junctions. So if you remember back to talking about cells, we have those tight junctions where it's almost like welding two cells together in a sense, and that allows them to stay nice and tightly packed together. From there, um, we're going to have a little bit of a gap sometimes in between cells. And so we may have a little bit of a gap there in between two cells, it kind of comes back together again. And so we're going to have these intercellular clefts um, that are left inside there that allows for some fluid and some tissues, or not tissues, but uh, nutrients to slip through in between those cells themselves. And so those substances can move from the inside to the outside of that capillary and allow for some of those fluids to move through there. So here we have an example of a continuous capillary. Um, we see that we have cells right next to one another. They're, they're bound together with those gap junctions. Um, there are little intercellular clefts. So we do have a little bit of space that is in between um, the cells in spaces and that allows for us to move fluids in and out of those capillaries. It's surrounded by a basement membrane here and that basement membrane again is continuous. It creates kind of like a, a smooth wrap around the endothelial cells that are there uh, and limits the amount of substances that can pass through it as well. Fenestrated capillaries, a little bit more leaky. Um, these ones are going to have a large amount of pores 
otherwise known as fenestrations within them. And this is going to allow for uh, much greater amounts of solutes and a little bit larger solutes to pass through the membranes themselves. This is going to be important in certain places where we want uh, kind of big things to be able to pass through, namely nutrients. And so in the small intestines for absorption, we need to have kind of larger areas that are there. In the kidneys, uh, we see this as well. In order to filter the blood, we need fenestrated capillaries as well. So we can basically push everything that's in the blood out and move it through those fenestrations that are there. And then in order to get large hormones, things like that, uh, the endocrine glands are going to be riddled with fenestrated capillaries as well. And this allows for us to have these big open spaces, in a sense, in the cells themselves. And so there's a tiny little pore there. And that allows for larger nutrients to be able to pass through the cells and either get into the blood vessel or to get out of the blood vessel, depending upon where we are, depending upon what the goal is of those capillaries that we have. The last of our capillaries is the sinusoid. Sinusoids are essentially not even, in a sense, like a, a complete blood vessel, so to speak. They are very, very leaky. They allow for much larger substances to, to pull, be pulled through the, the membranes themselves. And these are going to be in places where oftentimes we need to have whole cells, like red blood cells, white blood cells, to move through them, and or large proteins. And so we need things that are going to be able to get moved through there that are relatively large um, in places like the liver, bone marrow, um, liver where we're producing things like proteins, where we're uh, detoxifying larger chemical substances that may be in the blood, bone marrow where we're making those blood cells um, to get them from the bone marrow itself into the actual blood vessels and move on to go do their job as they move through them. In order for this to occur, sinusoids are have a relatively slow movement or flow of blood moving through them. Uh, so this is going to allow for all of these processes to occur, whether it is uh, moving substances into them or out of them, whether it is getting blood cells to move into them, whether it is allowing for things like even uh, macrophages to move in and out of the, the tissues in places like the, the lymphoid organs um, or even the liver. And we have our cup for cells there and destroying things that shouldn't be there. So big, large intercellular clefts uh, that are in between the cells and big, large, in a sense, basically holes inside the cells themselves as well. And so this allows for potentially these red blood cells here to slip into the bloodstream from bone marrow um, or for chemical substances that may be inside here to be able to be detoxified by the hepatocytes inside the liver as they're traveling along through here uh, they have the the chance to become broken down and detoxified in the liver itself the capillaries are typically found residing in what we call capillary beds and so inside these little capillary beds we have the ability to absorb and uh, secrete different substances into the tissues themselves. But the capillary beds themselves are not always uh, having the same amount of blood flow at all times. It all really depends upon the needs of the tissue at that particular time. And coming into the capillaries, we have a series of vessels that are there. And so we have what we call a met arterial. And then we have true capillaries. The met arterial is basically like a bypass, and that bypass is going to run, I'm going to skip ahead here real quick. Um, the bypass is going to run through the center of the capillary bed and allow for blood flow to move um, through there. When that capillary bed is being fed by blood supply, the precapillary sphincters here are going to relax, and they're going to allow for blood flow to flow into the capillary bed and through all of our true capillaries. 
that makes its way through. Uh, nutrients are going to come out of the, the capillary bed. Waste products are going to come back into the capillary bed, all depending upon what is happening at that particular moment in time. The process then, in a sense, shuts off when we need to have less blood flow coming into that tissue. And so if this is, say, a muscle, and you're using that muscle, we're going to have a situation where all those sphincters are nice and open, and we're flooding the, the muscle with nutrients, with oxygen, getting it into the, the muscle itself. But when we stop using that muscle, and all of the, the needs of that, of that muscle have been met, those sphincters can then close. And so we now have the ability to use the thoroughfare channel, our med arterial, and allow for blood to basically bypass that particular tissue. We see this as well when we have something like our skin. And so when the skin is uh, well vascularized, uh, we see it, or if it's even hypervascularized, uh, we see it as being nice and bright and red and things like that. But if we take that blood supply away, um, in the case of this, it's going to be then become pale. It's going to become uh, decreased in its, its blood supply. And so the tissue itself is going to look more pale inside there. And that's because we've taken that blood away. The capillaries themselves can serve as a nice blood reserve. So we can have a large amount of blood there. Way back when we talked about... Uh, the skin in our AMP1, uh, we talked about the skin as being a blood reserve as well. We're able to hold that blood there and allow for the blood to uh, either be out in the skin or we can draw it in in times of need where we need to potentially increase our blood pressure. And so we can pull that back into the, the system and pull as much as 5% of our blood volume back into the veins uh, when we're needed at that point. From those capillary beds, we then move into venules. And so we have our post-capillary venules. Uh, these are the smallest of the blood vessels. These are gonna have just barely an endothelium, a little bit more of the pericytes that we see in the capillaries, and that's about it. But those venules are going to feed into larger venules, and then those larger venules are gonna then feed into the veins and then the veins eventually back into the heart. As we get into these larger venules, uh, we may see a few different layers start to pop up uh, and we're gonna start to see now more of a tunica media as we start to see more smooth muscle. Same as what we talked about at the very beginning there. And those veins just continue to converge and converge. Uh, more and more larger veins come together until we eventually get back to our two vena cava, either the superior or the inferior vena cava, uh, and that's going to bring the blood back in towards the heart once it's there. Once we get into these larger vessels as well, the three tunics are now completely back in. So we have a tunica media, we have our tunica intima, and then we have our tunica externa that's there. And so all three of them are going to be in the, the layers there, and that's going to allow for that blood to come back. Not only do we have a blood reservoir in the capillaries, but we also have a blood reservoir in the venous side of the system as well. And so when we look at how much blood is in either the arterial side or the venous side, we see that 65% of the blood is over here in the veins. And so we have a huge amount of blood in the veins themselves, which allows us to use those smooth muscles to be able to bring back in to the system uh, more blood when needed. And so if we need to have an increase in blood pressure at some point, we have the ability to very quickly uh, pull that blood back into the arterial side as well. And so we can use those smooth muscles to smooth that blood further back towards the heart. Because of that large lumen that the veins have, they have a much lower blood pressure. And so they have a much lower blood pressure than that of the arteries. They also end up having thinner walls. And so we saw that on the, the image there at the very beginning. So when we look at kind of the, the difference between an artery and a vein, here we have a vein 
and an artery of the exact same size. We have a much thicker wall and a much smaller lumen. And so the two there have very much different uh, components as far as blood pressure goes. So low blood pressure in the vein, decreased resistance, and in the artery we have an increase in resistance. That is there. And so those are going to change depending upon where we are. In the venous side as well, we also then may see some valves. And so we're going to see valves interspersed throughout the, the system itself. Um, and so we have the ability to hold back that blood supply once it moves up. The veins are oftentimes working against gravity. So especially if we're moving back from our, uh, say, our, our legs up to our heart, uh, gravity is working against us and we don't have a pump on that venous side. And so we don't have that ability to get that blood in there. Vein, veins themselves um, are relatively easily collapsible because of that thin wall. And you can see that just simply by looking at the back of your hand. So if you look at the back of your hand, you'll see that you have blood vessels typically that kind of pop out, and especially if you have it well below your heart, those blood vessels will pop out pretty well. If you then raise those, your arm above your hand, you'll then see that those blood vessels, in a sense, kind of disappear. They collapse, they flatten out. And that's where gravity is now helping us to drain those blood vessels um, as that's occurring. So gravity is pulling that blood down through them much easier, and it allows for increased drainage of that area. Hence the reason why if we have an injury to an area of the body, we're going to elevate it. We're going to keep it above our heart to help to drain that fluid out of that area that is potentially swelling. Blood vessels themselves do an awful lot of mixing and blending and, and branching and everything like that. And this is what we call anastomoses. And so an anastomosis is essentially, especially on the arterial side, um, this is where we allow for blood vessels to kind of take an indirect route in a sense. And so the direct route around a joint especially may be going straight through that joint. And so if this is, say, our my crude drawing of a leg here, um, and that's the back of the knee. There's the knee. Our uh, direct route would be just a straight line. However, because we do things like bend our knee um, and we do flexion of the knee and things like that, we're going to need some branches to get us around that potential blockage that's there. And that allows us to, to essentially move around that particular area and make sure that we have adequate blood supply, kind of no matter what we're doing. So whether our, our, our leg is bent, whether it is straight, um, we have this blood supply making it through that particular area. The capillaries were an example of having a uh, anastomosis as well, because we're moving through the capillary bed itself. And so we're getting this large uh, output of capillaries coming from the arterial side. Uh, they branch out, they move across the tissue itself so that we don't have just a single blood vessel kind of supplying that particular area. And then they eventually coalesce back in toward the vein as it comes back in. Because the blood vessels on the venous side don't have a pump and they have those thin walls, uh, they have the potential to become damaged when pressure builds within them uh, on those. And so the blood vessels you may have heard of can have varicosities or varicose veins. And these varicosities are where essentially the valve that is inside them, let me draw my vein here, and normally we have a valve that is keeping that blood going in a singular direction up. Uh, inside that vessel, that valve becomes damaged and it's no longer keeping the blood going in a single direction. The blood is able to go up and then it's able to come back down as well. And when that does that, that makes it so that essentially the next 
Val Dang is now having to hold the blood from this section as well as the section above. And so it starts to become under more and more pressure and is getting pushed on and so on. And so the blood vessel can start to become damaged with that once it's there. And so this causes these varicosities in the, the vessels themselves. Most commonly, or, or where people are most familiar with them, is generally in the legs. And so this can occur due to genetics. This can occur due to uh, increased weight of a person. This can occur due to pregnancy. Um, anything that essentially adds to increased pressure pushing down from the abdomen, restricting the blood flow coming up through those veins, um, has the potential to damage those vessels that are there. And so as that pressure of blood comes back in, it causes the blood vessels to start to become damaged and it bulges them out. Um, it stretches out the walls of the veins and we get those varicosities on the, the surface itself. This is the same thing that happens with somebody who has hemorrhoids. Um, essentially, varicosities are going to occur in places where we have unprotected veins. And so superficial veins, there's basically nothing next to them. So these vessels here on the skin have nothing pushing against them. The only thing pushing against them is the skin itself. And that's just not enough to maintain the integrity of those blood vessels there. Which is why if somebody was to then wear uh, support socks or support uh, stockings themselves, uh, compression socks, that uh, forces and provides for that extra compression from the outside and forces the blood to go up. And so that keeps that blood from pooling in the, the legs themselves and decreases the potential for any kind of varicosities that's there. And the same thing happens in things like the anal canal with hemorrhoidal veins. Um, sometimes people who are uh, alcoholics will develop uh, esophageal varicosities as well, uh, simply because of that added pressure around them. And the way to get rid of them uh, nowadays in terms of the kind of the most popular way is through venous uh, lasers and so they apply a catheter into the the vein itself and then that catheter has a laser that goes off inside of it and that causes a reaction in the blood vessel that essentially collapses the blood vessel and so then you have the ability to go from having the varicosities there to no varicosities and the body just creates new anastomoses to get around the lack of those blood vessels there that are on the superficial component there. Um, so we just do those to the superficial ones. And then from there, uh, the deeper ones are still flowing on the inside. Next up, we'll talk about the capillaries and their ability to exchange nutrients uh, within them.